We're talking about the Supreme Court decision granting President Trump partial immunity uh, and the difference between unofficial and official actions. And then we're going to talk to Brian Goldsmith, my friend, about what's happening behind the scenes. Hi, Brian. We're going to talk about polling that's come out, Brian, and sort of the pros and cons, obviously, of changing changing the race at this late juncture. But first, let's talk about the Supreme Court decision. What I was saying when we you got knocked off was it seemed to it indicate to me that President Biden is trying to sort of refocus the, the campaign and kind of uh, get people off the debate, get them to focus on the Supreme Court decision, which he called, uh, you know, a, a, a real danger to democracy, a disservice to this nation, uh, that it gave the presidency virtually no limits. So tell me about, you watched his comments. What did you think? Well, I thought they were very strong. And of course, had he performed at anything like that level last Thursday night, none of these conversations would be happening. But the question is not, you know, can he read remarks off a teleprompter effectively? Um, The question is, can he perform at a high enough level to beat Donald Trump? Um, Now, I thought your conversation earlier today with Neil Katyal was really excellent at kind of describing exactly the costs and consequences of this decision. And I highly recommend it to anybody watching now who wants to understand that ruling. I went to law school, but I'm no Neil Katyal, so watch him and not me on that. But as far as the politics goes, it just raises the stakes um, for this election even higher as though that were possible. It's like, you know, we're flying above Mount Everest now in terms of the, the height of this, because what it really means is the president is limited by his own conscience. The president is limited by his own character. The president is no longer really constrained that much by constitutional law. I mean, I, I think John Dean, who was famously Nixon's White House counsel, said earlier today that if if this ruling were in effect during Watergate, Nixon would have walked. Nixon would have skated because he could have just said that everything he did then was an official act. And the definition of official act is seemingly so broad and almost boundless well, that um, I was going to yeah. ask you. I was going to ask you, Brian. What is the difference between? I guess the lower court, according to Neil, is going to have to make the determination as to what is unofficial. But official was pretty clear as far as I could understand from Neil when it's kind of dealing with the Justice Department and asking about a rigged election, that that is considered official and what he did was perfectly fine? Well, that's the, that, that's the point. If, if, if trying to save his own skin by manipulating his power to overturn the results of the 2020 election is considered an official act, then ever, anything is an official act. Then, then you know, uh, for example, Trump posted yesterday a meme of Liz Cheney, you know, should go to prison or something like that. If he were to order the military to put her in Gitmo or the Justice Department to prosecute her um, based on his own perception of his political interests, but do it as president, would that be an official act? Well, if if fighting to overturn the election is an official act, how could that not be an official act? So I guess so what's I, most chilling about this decision is what it enables and entitles him to do if he is reelected. It's even less important in terms of his past activities, although it would have a big impact on this January 6th trial. But it will also empower him even more to do the things that he's threatened to do, seek retribution against his enemies, put journalists in prison, all these things that could potentially be seen as official acts. And ergo, he would not be um, held uh, legally accountable for things that might be against the law. Is that accurate? Seems like it. I mean, I think there are two phases of this. Phase one is the campaign. Phase two is, you know, if God forbid he wins, my perspective, I'm, I'm a partisan Democrat now. Um, phase one, um, this, 
probably guts the heart of uh, of the uh, the cases against Donald Trump on January 6. Jack Smith uh, probably cannot move forward um, as he planned under this interpretation of the law and the Constitution. Um, just reinforcing what a friend of mine said many years ago, which is Donald Trump is the luckiest SOB alive. Um, and and second, if he were to win, he would have all the means at his disposal, not just the awesome powers of the presidency before this case, but this new interpretation that basically says he's immune from from any consequences uh, to go after, uh, as he's promised, uh, people he views as as enemies, as his opponents, um, you know, deep staters. Uh, it's a it's a long list. Um, I mean, I, I had a prominent Democrat say to me today, should I be moving money outside the country? Because, you know, what if what if Donald Trump tries to imprison me and freeze my assets? I mean, that that is the level of conversation that at least some people were having. Let, let's talk about the political fallout from this. Do you think it's possible this does re-energize uh, the, the Biden base and it gets people frightened enough about the potential power of a Donald Trump presidency, that they give him a second look even after this debate performance, which I guess disastrous was the word of the day? Well, that can cut both, both ways. I mean, it certainly reinforces the imperative of, of winning the election um, because the costs of Trump winning are just so enormous. Um, but it, it probably uh, accelerates, um, heightens, the uh, the conversations that are happening right now about, you know, is the president the best candidate to beat Donald Trump? I mean, I think, as I said on on Thursday, I don't know anyone in Democratic politics who seriously doubts the president's capacity to do the job right now. I think all of the doubts are about the president's capacity to beat Donald Trump right now. And that's something that, you know, was thrown into uh, doubt uh, as a result of this performance. And, it, you know, I, I, let me just tell you why the comparisons to Obama 2012 are so um, facile and misleading. Um, nobody was concerned in 2012 about Barack Obama's, you know, physical and mental ability to do the job. Um, you know, a friend of mine said to me that, um, it would be as though Obama went on stage at a debate and said, you know, yeah, I'm a socialist who was born in Kenya. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that goes after a real vulnerability, a real, um, you know, weakness. And, and the number one doubt that people have about Joe Biden is his, is his age and his capacity. Let's talk talk about uh, sort of what is being said in democratic circles. I know you're not in the middle of the campaign, but you talk to an awful lot of people. I should point out that President Biden was behind Donald Trump in all the battleground states going into this debate. The Biden administration asked for the debate early to change the conversation. That was the goal. Um, and so it was a debate that was held earlier than previous debates. So. Uh, tell me about the polling that you've seen since the debate, and then we'll talk about the conversations that are going on in Democratic circles and indeed in the campaign itself. I mean, I'll, I'll share a little polling, but, but before I do, can I just emphasize and underline something you just said, which I think is getting missed in a lot of the commentary. This debate was three months earlier than any previous general election debate for president of the United States in the history of the United States. The, the earliest debate before this was like in late September. Why did this happen so early? This happened so early because the Biden campaign pushed for this to change the dynamic of the race that they were very narrowly but persistently losing in the battlegrounds. And he needed a good debate. <laughs> The opposite of that obviously happened. And so um, I, I would encourage your viewers to take the polling with a grain of salt 
but at the same time, not to ignore the polling. Um, I, I feel like sometimes people are so, you know, too sophisticated by half here. Uh, you know, polling's outmoded, who, who pays attention to this stuff. I mean, there was a serious analysis on 538 that showed that the 2022 polling was actually more accurate than any polling in decades. Um, polling is much harder. It's much more expensive now. The response rates are lower, so it takes a while to get the random sample that you're looking for. But polling is still the most valuable tool we have by far to measure public opinion. So where are we now? Well, weekend polling is notoriously unreliable. That's a whole other podcast or Instagram Live. Um, so we have to wait a little bit, I think, to get the bulk of, of the good polling. What the Biden campaign has said publicly is that, yes, in their data, they've seen significant concern about the president's performance, but that, that it has not affected the fundamentals of the race. They say that the race in the battlegrounds is still, you know, extremely close. Um, they say they're like one or two points behind in the seven battlegrounds, which is basically where they were uh, before the debate. That's, that's the party line. Um, and there are very good pollsters working for the Biden campaign. Um, now, we've seen some other data, and I'm just I'm looking off at my second screen well, here to be able to share I did see things. a CBS, I believe, Siena poll that said uh, that 72 percent of voters polled questioned Joe Biden's ability to do the job versus 65 percent before the debate. Right. But the question is, and that I didn't see the answer to in that poll, is how did that affect the horse race? In other words, I might come to the conclusion that I'm more concerned about Biden's performance, but does that make me want to go and vote for Trump? Probably not. So I, I don't think the Biden camp is arguing that voters saw a bad performance, a bad debate, and that that affected their perceptions of him personally. I think what they're arguing is the fundamentals are so locked and we're so tribal and the division um, between these sort of two camps is so vast. But I can't believe that this debate performance won't affect undecided voters. Right. How, you know, how, how, however many they are, I can't believe that some people won't say, goodness, we don't know if he's really well enough to do, to do this job. Right. And so, he, so here's what we're seeing. There's a, a, a pretty good poll in New Hampshire that just came out today that shows Biden down two. You know, you might say, oh, down two. That doesn't sound too bad. Well, Biden won New Hampshire by seven and a half four years ago. Um, so that represents, if it's accurate, a nine point swing away from Biden um, for a race that he won very narrowly four years ago. So if, if he's not winning New Hampshire fairly comfortably, that's a pretty bad sign for other even more competitive, more Republican states. Um, there's a Harvard-Harris poll, and a lot of people have questions about the methodology of this particular poll that shows Trump up six nationally. Now, I don't know political professionals who believe that Donald Trump is up six nationally, but just to give you a little context, um, Nate Silver has made a very good case that in 2012, the swing states were two points more democratic than the nation as a whole. So there was probably a possibility for Obama to lose the popular vote in 2012 and still get an electoral college majority. That's flipped this time in that the swing states in 2024 are probably two points more Republican than the country. And so, I mean, that probably was true in 2016 as well, where we saw Hillary win the popular vote nationally by two and a half, and she still couldn't get to 270 electoral college votes. So if Trump is winning the popular vote at all by 0 0.02, um, Biden is probably losing the electoral college. So that's concerning. Um, there was a Pennsylvania poll that came out this morning that showed Trump up four in Pennsylvania. I don't see a path for Biden getting reelected without winning Pennsylvania. Um, and finally, there was a morning consult national poll that showed Trump up one point nationally, obviously a hell of a lot closer than that Harvard-Harris poll. 
but still concerning given the context I shared about the Electoral College. I mean, these polls, I mean, do you think that things will settle down? I mean, this is just a snapshot of a given point in time, particularly after the debate. I mean, they could bounce all over the place, could they not, Brian, as long as uh, for Joe Biden, they're not continuing to trend in a certain direction? Uh, yes, but there's also a downside to that upside, which is that Biden has been persistently, very narrowly, but consistently behind in the battlegrounds for months and months now. Um, you know, I wrote a piece in The Atlantic about, you know, what Biden needed to do to win the debate, which is a very ridiculous little I was going to say kind of now, dated at this point. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, nobody needs to read that. But one of the points I made is, you know, historically incumbents at an incumbent president under 50 percent approval would be at risk of losing. You know, Biden has been around 40 percent approval for over a year, uh, maybe a year and a half. He hasn't been at 50 percent basically since the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So he's been in the danger zone for a long time because it's trump on the other side as opposed to nikki haley or marco rubio or some other more popular republican this election is extremely close and competitive because you know as sarah longwell once said the biggest coalition in american politics is not the pro-biden coalition it is the anti-trump coalition and that's a coalition that ranges from aoc to liz cheney you know it's it's ideologically mm -hmm. very heterodox. Um, and, and so that's what's keeping Biden in the game. Um, and, and, and that's what he's got to bank on now, that the campaign becomes less about him and more about Trump. Let's talk about real quickly what's, what the conversations are in democratic circles about switching courses midstream, actually late in the race. Um, so it seems to me, Brian, that the Biden folks are between a rock and a hard place. They're, they're kind of committing to, it was a bad night, he's going to continue. He, you know, we can't judge him for one bad night. I know that a lot of elected officials in the Democratic Party are afraid to, you know, say out loud that they think there should be a change in the ticket. So what do you think they're going to do? Because it will destroy his legacy, obviously, if he loses to Donald Trump. On the other hand, I guess it will turn the Democratic uh, Party and the convention into a pretty chaotic event, unless they anoint somebody prior to that, as you and I have discussed. Sir, what are the pros and cons, real quickly, of, of Joe Biden getting out of the race and saying, I'm only gonna be a one-term president for the good of the country, as many people from Maureen Dowd to Nicholas Kristof to Tom Friedman to Richard Haas to David Remnick. I mean, I could go to the New York Times editorial board and I'm sure you can name more people Atlanta than that. Journal Constitution editorial you know, board. You no, know, I so, mean, a long list. So, yeah. so everyone's calling for that and yet, you know, we're hearing from Democrats and even Gavin Newsom and Ralph Warnock and people like that saying, no, you know, Joe Biden is the guy. So just real quickly before we go, because I want you to be with your children. And meanwhile, my husband is finding this conversation riveting. <laughs> you know, I've always had a very soothing effect on Mulder. You know, he just... <laughs> He hears my voice and he just <laughs> relaxes. Well, I have to kick him because he was starting to snore. You know, I think he's closing his eyes because he's just thinking very deeply <laughs> yeah, about the it points that you and I are making. But no, seriously. So seriously, like, okay, okay. I'm not sure how quickly I can do this because there, there's a lot there. Okay, well, let me say a couple of things. One, I think the three biggest metrics to watch over the next few days are the following, uh, polling, money, and elected officials. Uh, not editorial boards, not Washington pundits. I think Biden takes great pleasure and the people around him in thumbing their nose at you know commentators and columnists, even the ones they like. 
You know, I can imagine, as much as I love David Remnick, I can imagine somebody going to Joe Biden and saying, sir, the editor of The New Yorker has called for you to step down as the Democratic nominee and imagining what his reaction to that would be. Um, but I think these three metrics matter. OK, let's let's go through them. money. Uh, the Biden campaign had a financial challenge going into this debate, which is that the last two months they've been outraised by Trump and the Republicans. Now, part of the rally around the flag effect was a, a burst of, of uh, fundraising, particularly small dollar fundraising enthusiasm in the immediate aftermath of the, of the debate. So money is not an immediate problem, but there's a lot of concern among big donors about the president's capacity to beat Trump. Does that translate into a real slowdown in money coming in the door? And, and without that, the campaign can't really function effectively. OK, number two, polling. As I said, the polling that matters, I think, is primarily going to come out over the next few days, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, maybe even into the weekend and next week. And, and that will tell the tale of did Biden's poor performance actually make the horse race, you know, significantly worse? And, and then I think connected to that is my third factor, which is elected officials. I think that's the group that, that Biden has sort of the most trust and confidence in. People who put their names on a ballot, people who are tested before the voters and have to be held accountable by the voters. Um, you know, we saw Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island um, with a very concerned uh, sort of statement today. Uh, Anyone whether... else? I know Jamie Raskin said there are serious conversations going on. Right. I think, I think people are, I think there's tremendous affection and respect for President Biden. And so I don't think anyone takes this lightly. Um, so I think people are waiting to see what the fallout is. Um, and I think if you if you see bad polling um, and if people hear from their voters over the 4th of July when they're all going to be home in their states and districts, I think you may see, you know, a, a significant number of elected officials coming out public. Because there, and that, there's a I lot think, of concern with down ballot races, right? Right. I mean, I mean, you have you have senators like, you know, Sherrod Brown in Ohio and John Tester in Montana who are in tough shape. But, you know, the funny thing is it's kind of a reverse coattail effect where these Democratic senators, Jackie Rosen in Nevada, are outperforming the president in their states. But they don't expect that to that gap to be sustainable. They think, you know, we've gotten so tribal that I think in the last three or four election cycles, the only senator who got reelected while the opposing party won her state was Susan Collins. Otherwise, effectively, every time, you know, people vote kind of consistently up and down the ballot. And so how, you know, John Tester knows that, that Joe Biden is not going to win Montana, but Joe Biden losing by 10 and Joe Biden losing by 20 are two very different scenarios. And the same for, you know, Brown in Ohio, um, for Rosen in Nevada, for Bob Casey in Pennsylvania. Um, you've got a lot of very respected, longtime Democratic senators running for re-election. Some of them running for re-election, by the way, in part because Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer pushed them hard not to retire, but to run one more time because otherwise those seats would be lost. Has there been any conversations that you know of? You sent me the New York Magazine article that said it would be very difficult for the Democratic Party if Kamala Harris isn't chosen, if in fact it's determined that President Biden would not run again, because that would further splinter the party, that black Americans would be very angry that this, you know, the first black woman, black, you know, uh, Asian woman uh, to become vice president was tossed aside for maybe a white man or a white woman and that that would create all kinds of problems. Having said that, her polling is lower than President Biden's polling, even though she does better among Latinos and black Americans. So, um, you know, if this decision is made, it's also very problematic. Is it not in terms of selecting the person 
either pre-convention or during the convention, who would replace Joe Biden and also who has the nat national stature to kind of attract, um, you know, a big portion of the electorate. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really messy. There, there is risk all around here. There is no risk-free path moving forward. There is risk to the president being the candidate. There is risk to some alternative being the candidate. Um, I think that there would have to be some sort of a process. Um, first of all, the president would have to take himself out of this race. No one is going to take him out. He right. has to take himself but out. But I mean, um, do you think that President Obama and President Clinton and other people could meet with him and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and kind of have a come to Jesus conversation if in fact they decide that it's going to be another disaster on election day if he stays in the race? Maybe. I mean, you know, people are raising all sorts of uh, possibilities like that. I don't know whether private conversation or public pressure um, has more, um, you know, meaning for the president. I, I don't know whether this is something he's even actively considering or whether he views this as something that just needs to be cleaned up and, and then he can move on. The other but, thing I was thinking, sorry to interrupt, Brian, but the other thing I was thinking is if I were somebody who was seriously considering, then I promise I'm going to let you go, <laughs> running in 2028, if I'm an up and coming Democrat and I think, gosh, I want to run, but I need to get all my ducks in a row. I need to get more experience under my belt. I need to kind of like, if, if I were one of those people, I'm not sure I would want to throw my hat in the ring uh, at, this, at this point in time. Now, John says, of course, you know, if you're called to serve, you do it. On the other hand, I don't know. What do you think about that? I think history is full of examples of candidates trying to be strategic and waiting until a better time and it doesn't work out for them that their time passed. Yeah. So Mario Cuomo didn't run in 92 because he thought Bush was for sure going to get reelected. Chris Christie didn't run in 2012 because he thought it was too soon. Um, I, I mean, there's just a, there's a long list. And, and so I think if you if you have the again, we're talking in the hypothetical world in which Biden has taken himself out of the race and there's some process by which candidates are competing for the nomination. I think if you want to be president, you compete for the nomination. You don't try to overthink it because you don't know what's going to happen in four years or eight years. Your time may have come and gone. So you, you, you go out there and you make your case. Um, I think for some of these candidates, 24 might be a better possibility for them than 28 because in 28, you know, you could have a whole new generation of you know, governors who were just elected in 2022 running, the governors who were elected in, in 18, like Whitmer, you know, they would be out of office at that point. It's just impossible to predict the future. And so, um, yeah, I think I think they run. I think if, if, if Biden takes himself out, I think Newsom, Whitmer, Harris, you know, lots of people um, would run. Hey. Before we go, so many people are saying, who decides what's an official act and what's an unofficial act in terms of if you're granted immunity? It, it does seem, I haven't read the opinion. Um, I've seen excerpts. I've seen Sonia Sotomayor's dissent. But like, ultimately, is this the lower court judge who's going to make this decision? Who decides and is it a case by case basis? And does it mean while he's president, Joe Biden can do anything he wants and he won't be held accountable? Uh, I think to that last point, it's hard for me to believe that Joe Biden would do stuff that, you know, he's such an institutionalist that would diverge significantly from what prior presidents would have done. So I believe that he's bound by character and tradition to act as our presidents of the United States have acted over, you know, many, many years. Um, it is not clear to me, um, again, I haven't read the whole, uh, the whole decision either, um, how this is determined, you know, who is the arbiter, because, for example, if a lower court judge says that something is not an official act, presumably it would then just be appealed to the intermediate court that might 
come to a different conclusion. And then of course it could be appealed again to the US Supreme Court, which could have yet another, I mean, there's such a strong 6-3 kind of pro-imperial presidency majority on this court that I think no one really, I mean, again, this is just an early reaction. I'm not sure how, how seriously people are gonna take the lower court rulings on this because any administration would just think, oh, we can kick it to the Supreme Court and they'll side with us because the initial decision has such a broad definition of official act. You know, you said that it's gonna be polling, donors, and elected Money. officials. And, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. 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 polling, yeah. donors, and elected officials. Yeah. yeah, so have you seen any indication that donors are starting? To, I saw one on CNN, uh, you know, that said he wasn't, that donors were strongly behind uh, President Biden. I don't know if he's representing the bulk of donors. What are you hearing about that? I mean, this is anecdotal. I haven't conducted a scientific poll, obviously, of these donors, but you know, I've heard a lot of concern. Um, I haven't heard anyone say that they feel good about this situation. I mean, I guess the most pro-Biden comment I've heard is, um, you know, it was one bad night. The alternative is chaos. We've just got to move forward. But I would say that's a minority view among the people I've been talking to. The majority view is, you know, let's see how this uh, resonates with the American people. Let's, you know, let's see the polling come back. Let's see how the president conducts himself over the next, you know, week or two. Um, and and the then, most legitimate polling is still yet to come in. It's right. Basically, the thing. Right. The, the, the Sunday polls showing 72% feel uncomfortable with him running. Well, no, the, he's not CBS is a good, the CBS is a good poll, but I just don't know what that means. Like that, that could be the view of the pro Biden donor who said he had a bad night and it made him uncomfortable, but he's still all in right. Biden. So we just, I think what we have to see is the effect on the race itself. Is this moving undecided voters in a measurable way. And also, you know, it, I've been reading that he's considering doing a high profile interview about his health and about his performance. So, well, that would be the, obviously that would not be as meaningful as the debate, but that would be meaningful. Right. Um, and to, to be asked questions about public policy and some other things where Perhaps it might mitigate the bad night he had. It might not totally, but it will. It might ease people's concerns. Maybe he'll talk to me, Brian. I, I was just about to say I, I nominate who better. Um, I, I mean it. I'm not joking. I, I, I think I think he totally should. You've been, um, you know. I, I think you should have this this interview with President Biden. I, I see some hearts um, on the. Uh, <laughs> on the, on well, the Instagram live right now. I totally well, these, are, these are my followers. Of course they think that, but um, why don't you call your friend Anita Dunn and, and talk to her about that? Because I've been <laughs> trying, I've been trying to sit down and have a conversation and a serious interview, which they've really been avoiding, Brian. You know, he does Howard Stern and Conan, not that Howard and Conan aren't good interviewers, but they're not really, you know, digging into public policy. So um, maybe he'll he'll sit down with me and and we can have a serious conversation about his plans for the next four years and um, and see how he answers questions. I think I think they should. And I'm happy to I, I have zero influence, I think, with this White House. So I, I'm happy to try. Well, but anyway, know. I'm going to I'm going to write them again. Um, now that I've read that they're considering it. Hey, everyone, thank you for joining my little show with Brian. Um, Brian, thank you for your insights, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. I know you said your text messages were blowing up today. I'd love to read them sometime. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll just I'll forward them all to you. Yeah. Um. <laughs> anyway, thanks for taking the time. Now go be with your Thanks family. for having okay, me. Okay, bye, bye, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.